dedicated to each and every one of you who appreciate a great glass of wine. You know what I mean? It's Monday. Let's raise a glass to the beginning of another week. It's time to unscrew, uncork, or saber a bottle. And let's begin exploring the wine glass. Today, I am bringing you something a little bit different. I will be talking about the Irish folklore, wine-loving cousin of the leprechaun, the Cluricon. Stories of the Cluricon date back centuries, and they have always intrigued me. So I wanted to introduce you to these jovial but territorial little fellows. Hey everybody, I'm Lori Budd, a UC Davis winemaking program, someday service, champagne specialist, and WSET level 2 graduate. You can find Exploring the Wine Glass on all the socials, as well as your favorite podcast catchers. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's the perfect time to swipe, subscribe, rate, and review. I promise I'll never tell you what to drink, but I'll always share what's in my glass. Before we get into the lore, I have a huge favor to ask. Exploring the Wine Glass is up for a podcast award, but I need your help in getting to the finals. If you could please take a moment to scroll through the show notes and click the link to vote for me. I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. No, no, no. So here's the thing. Have you ever had two worlds collide? Everyone who knows me knows that I'm a wine lover. That's pretty obvious. I love learning new things about wine, and that is good since, honestly, no matter how much you know about wine, there is always something else that you can tuck away into your memory bank. However, not everyone knows that I am also a major horror fan. I am a full guts and gore fanatic. The bloodier, the better. I have watched horror films as long as I can remember. I probably was watching them long before the movie ratings said that I should. I mean, when I was a kid, my family went on vacation to Florida. It rained and rained, so my mom decided to take us to the movies. We went to go see Jaws. In 1975, I was seven years old. I loved that movie. And when we came out of the movie, lo and behold, it had stopped raining. What was the first thing I did? I begged my mom to take me to the store to get a red blow-up raft, and I went into the ocean. And I know, there's something a bit wrong about that. But I had a blast on that trip. Think about it. I was seven, and I still remember that trip clear as day. As I grew up, I still loved all things horror. I remember sneaking into Friday the 13th when I was 12 years old. The movie traumatized so many people, but I laughed at the stupidity of the people who were being killed by Jason. Then came Nightmare on Elm Street. Freddy Krueger was incredible. I loved that movie. The concept that you could be attacked while in your dreams, well, you gotta admit, that was pretty clever. But the thing is, you could only be attacked if you were fearful. So. I was never afraid. I went to college, and my poor roommate, Jamie, had to live not only with a life-size Freddy Krueger, but the most incredible 3D image of him coming out of the wall. To this day, she still reminds me of how insane that was and how freaked out she was. But it even gets a little worse. Since I lived in New Jersey and went to college in California, I wrote New Line Cinemas, the production studio for Nightmare on Elm Street, I asked them if they could please let me be in the next Nightmare on Elm Street movie. I explained that I lived a bi-coastal life, and whether they filmed in New York or California, I could be there. I also told them that they didn't need to pay me anything to be in the film. My only request was to be killed by Freddy. They could kill me in the first scene or take me to the end. No payment needed, just death by Freddy. Now, I thought that was a slam dunk. I mean, who wouldn't want to at least bring in a person who is willing to work for free? Alas, I never heard back from them. My mom says I'm lucky they didn't send the police or a psychiatric patrol after me. So you see, Supernatural and I have always been in a love affair. All of my favorite shows involve some sort of supernatural phenomena. So by now you're probably asking yourself, what the heck am I listening to? I thought this was a wine podcast. Why am I listening to a conversation about Freddy Krueger? So I'm going to bring it back to the sentence that started this podcast. Have you ever had your two worlds collide? Well, mine did when I came across a Cluricon. I am pretty confident that you have all heard of a Leprechaun. By the way, another favorite movie of mine, Leprechaun. 
much less known than Friday the 13th or Nightmare on Elm Street or my beloved Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Pretty much sure the only people who know Leprechaun are diehard fans of Jennifer Aniston. So yeah, I know you're now scrolling, checking out Google to see that movie. Well, a Clericon is a distant relative of the Leprechaun. As much as the Leprechaun loves his pot of gold, Clericon love their wine. He is a fairy with a twist. A true Irishman or woman would tell you that fairies do exist and that they are more troublesome than one would wish. They live in fairy rings, which are raised earthen circular mounds that are visible all over Ireland. Travelers may go and make a wish among these fairy rings, but be sure not to disturb them because fairies are not happy when they're disturbed. Fey folk are viewed as smaller winged individuals, often female, while leprechauns are wingless fairy men who may have a bit of an obsession with shoes and are known to cause general mischief. I know Americans love to dress up as them during St. Patrick's Day, and they always wear green, but as an FYI, if you really want to act like a leprechaun, you wouldn't be caught dead wearing green. It is red that they don. So both consider themselves guardians of ancient treasures from the time when the Danes traveled through Ireland. They do hide their treasure at the end of a rainbow, and they must grant you three wishes if you catch them. But the thing is, fairy folk are often in a good mood, and when they aren't, you better watch out. They are tricksters. We all have that cousin or uncle that make a spectacle of themselves at family gatherings. Well, fairy folk are notorious drinkers, and if they're having a bad day, you will become a victim of their mischief. Well, that is the Clericon. The Clericon is the cousin of the Leprechaun, also known by his nibs. They are all males. Guess there's sexist there. But it is the supernatural world, and you know what? We have to live within their rules. Like the Leprechaun, the Clericon are Irish mythical creatures. Technically, the Clericon is a solitary Irish fairy. Unlike Leprechauns, who are typically found in groups, the Clericon prefer the solitary life, and they protect wine versus their pot of gold. They are pranksters and jokesters, and very rarely seen without wine in their hand. In the 1825 folktale, The Haunted Cellar, by Thomas Crofton Croker, Clericon are described as heavy-drinking little fellows with faces like withered apples and noses plump and purple from all of the boozing. Due to their fondness for wine, they often sneak into wine cellars in order to haunt them. Clericons were known to carry magical purses which contained a lucky shilling or a springnail skilliga that always returned to the purse, no matter how many times it was spent on purchasing wine. I mean, seriously, wouldn't that be awesome? You go, you buy a classic Bordeaux or your favorite bottle of wine, and that lucky shilling returns right back to your wallet. Clericons are loyal creatures and tend to attach themselves to families, mostly noble as they are the ones with the best wine cellars. Well, they attach themselves to wine cellars more than people. So if you move, unless you leave your wine, they're going to move with you. The Clericon is great to have around the house because he will protect your home from vandals and thieves. But his all-time favorite place is to be in your wine cellar. And as long as you treat them well, they will protect your wine. When happy, you can hear him singing Irish folk songs. But they easily anger, especially if you call them by their cousin's name, Leprechaun. In which case, they tend to become a wee tad emotional. If they feel they have been mistreated, or you do insult them, or worse, pull their favorite wine out of the cellar, they will wreak havoc on your home and spoil the remaining wine stock. So be smart and be courteous. If you feel that the benefits outweigh the negatives, here are two ways to call the Clericon to your home. First, you can leave some wine out for him in your wine cellar, but if you want to improve your chances, there is a welcoming ritual you can perform. In this spell, you are asking the Clericon to bless and protect your home. Hey all, 
I am so thrilled to be up for a podcast award, and I totally need your help to make it to the finals. Simply use the link in the show notes to register and vote for Exploring the Wine Glass under the Arts category. The directions are in the show notes. And while I'm asking for favors, you know what? I might as well go all out and ask you to also rate and review Exploring the Wine Glass. It's the best way to help other wine lovers find me. So thanks for all of your help in getting me to the finals. Slancha! You first need a chalice full of wine and a magic wand. Begin by drawing a circle and calling in the elements. With your wand in your right hand and the chalice of wine in your left, stand in front of the north point of the circle while saying, Clutercons and all good house fairies, protect this home with your energies. Go around to the east, south, and west points in that order and repeat the same statement. Clutercons and all good house fairies, protect this home with your energies. Once this is completed, return to your altar and place the chalice of wine on it while saying, I offer my thanks to this wine. To the Clutercons, this is my sign. Bless the fairies always, blessed be. Then thank the Clutercons, bid farewell to the elements, and pull up the circle. Be sure to leave the chalice of wine on your altar overnight, and in the morning, pour it into the earth as an offering to the fairies. Most importantly to remember, the quantity of wine in your collection does not matter. It is the variety that is most paramount. Be careful what you wish for, because Clodocons are easily angered. There are many theories, and no one really knows why. Some say they get too drunk, while others say it is because there is enough wine for them to drink. When happy, a Clurican will make sure all wine is maintained properly and none wasted. But an angry Clurican might slurp up all of the supplies, take night rides on your dog's back, and smash your most prized bottles. They can scare pets and make a general mess of things. Clurican's can control up to 10 gallons of wine through telekinesis, and in doing so, they can make bottles squirt fluid with extreme force. So think hard and long before inviting one to your cellar. So, what do you think? Would you welcome a Clutercon into your home? You can bet your last spring Neskelena that I would, and I would be thrilled to share many a glass with him. Slancha! Through the red, red wine. This has been another episode of Exploring the Wine Glass. Thanks for listening. If you have suggestions on what topics you would like me to discuss, please reach out on social media. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Exploring the Wine Glass. I am also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoypud. Of course, you can always email me at exploringthewineglass at gmail.com. If you enjoyed what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe to help others find me more easily. And most importantly, tell your wine-loving friends, because if you like the podcast, they will too. Music? Is wine by Kevens. Until next week, slancha. Give me the wine, 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 wine,